<clears throat> okay, good evening everyone, and welcome to the town hall meeting this evening where we want to continue our work here in Buffalo Public Schools, and we have some very special guests with us this evening, our own students. They're the featured guests. They are the reason why we work. So I have some slides that I had normally prepared to take you through, and I will say something about them, but the main work tonight, when I look around and I judge the context that we're living in right now in Buffalo over the events of the last week, we're going to pivot a bit and start in sooner with listening to our students, hearing their voice about the issues that are before us today. And then we'll certainly open it up for questions from the audience and the media. So this won't be a long introduction part before we get into a different agenda for tonight, okay? My name is Brian Cash. I am the school superintendent for the Buffalo Public Schools and your servant leader. What I do know is that this, in many ways, is our most challenging year in our careers as professional educators. I dare say in talking with many of our students, our teachers, our parents, and all of our many staff, they also have indicated in different ways that this has been a challenging year. It's a different kind of year than we've had before. And yet, we must continue the work, we must continue to move forward, we must continue to uplift our scholars every day. So one of the things I want to be clear about is that I have tried, and it was a design decision, it was a design decision to say, wait a minute, I get it. That tragedy will never go away. It will be indelible in our history here in Buffalo of a week and a half ago, a week ago. However, I wanted to stand in the breach because I've seen what is happening all over the country, and I have been in this work for 45 years, and I know that in urban education, sometimes, wittingly or not, we have turned one incident, one tragic event, into a big swath that colors all of the children, that colors all of the schools, that colors all of the environments in our city. And I know that not to be true. So I wanted to be careful about that, and I wanted to try to continue to show and demonstrate all the great work that is, in, that is still going on, even as we heal. So we must heal, we must work together to heal, but we must also not lose sight of our children, our main, main, precious children that we are serving every day. So that was last week. This week, in a reassessment of what I must do as a leader, I have decided that we need to take a little more time because this is traumatic for people. Regardless of how we may feel or where we may be in our lives, we have to appreciate what has happened here. And so I wanted to take more time to listen and to adjust our plans, to adjust our work, and to hear from our community. So that's what we're going to focus tonight. And then I'll come back to these slides near the end so that we can show that this is the path forward. This is what we must continue to work on after the winter I'm sorry, I guess the February break at this point. So that's the plan. That's how we're going to do it. Now let me say again at the top, I want to thank all the parents who've been working with us, all of the staff who've been working with us, our principals, our teachers, all of this devoted and dedicated staff to my right. This is my 18. 
This is my 18. They're few in number, but they're great in their performance. And I appreciate them more and more every day. So I want to give them the due appreciation. And parents out there, colleagues out there, this is the team that makes it happen for, for everyone. So if you have questions at the end of this, come up here and I'll connect you with these difference makers. Difference makers right here. All right, so tonight I want to take a little different tack. I want to thank all the people who've been helping us over this past week. Special commendation to all of the staff who helped at McKinley High School. But now, I think it's appropriate because adults have dominated the conversation over this past week. And I think we need to hear from our scholars. And we have many, many scholars in our district. And these are the students that make the system go. So Dr. Fatima Morrell, our esteemed colleague who works on issues of culturally and responsive literacy and initiatives and growing our students' voice, their confidence and their academic acumen, she's here to introduce these students and then we'll open up for some questions that I have for them that will allow them to share in their own authentic way. I haven't edited any papers or edited any statements. And media, you can feel free to ask our students as well. And we'll begin our conversation, a courageous conversation with the superintendent and the community here at West Turtle. I do want to recognize Cecily Owens. Cecily Owens is the esteemed principal here at West Turtle. She's a great principal. She's right over here. Cecily Owens. Appreciate you, Cecily. Okay, Dr. Morrell. Thank you, Dr. Cash. I'm actually going to pass the mic and allow the students to introduce themselves, their Excellent. school, their grade level, and the programs that they represent today. So I'll start right here with Jaden. Hello, my name is Jamie Coronado. I am from Performing Arts High School, and I am an 11th grader, and I am a part of the SSJ program. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Anusha Dikari. I'm a senior at Hustech High School. I'm also a scholar from Social Distance. It's nice to meet you. Hello, my name is Natalie Canales. I am from McKinley High School. I am a junior and I'm part of the r Story program. Hello, my name is Prince Mandu. I am from Riverside High School. I, I am a junior and I am part of the MBK program. I'm, I am a fellow. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Say something about your program. Yes. So, um, yes, thank you. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you to our scholars um, for coming out tonight. I know that, you know, I'm always asking them to raise their voice around issues, and um, sometimes they're not aware that I'm going to ask them to do that. And so, you know, last minute, I kind of asked them this. So, I appreciate them. And I just want to say, don't be nervous. Our programs are here to edify the voices of our children, all of our children and to give them a space, a space for intellectual safety, a space to be themselves, and to speak their own truth. And so the plethora of programs that the students represent, all of them, uh, one of the primary foundational uh, pieces is that they get to speak their own truth and that they get to raise their voices around issues of concern and to advocate for social justice for themselves. So without further ado, we can start with our first question. Okay. So colleagues, um, I haven't scripted any of these questions, but I'm listening as we go. I heard Hutch Tech, I heard Vaspa, Performing Arts, I heard McKinley, and I heard Riverside, correct? That's a good cross-section, colleagues, of our 20 high schools here in Buffalo. I think I'd ask the question to start off is, 
how do you feel about your high school? Tell, tell me about your high school. How do you feel about it? All of what you feel and think about your high school. Say a few words about it. My high school, um, performing arts. Um, I love my high school. Um, I've been to many other schools before performing arts. And one thing that I noticed, and also my parents noticed, is that um, ever since I've um, started going to DAFA, I've been a lot more vocal um, socially, and also vocally, I'm um, a vocal major, and um, DAFA. They have a wide variety of different art programs, you know, um, drawing, vocal, um, you know, instrumental. So there's so many different things that you can do. And I think that DAFA um, kind of gave me pride, basically. I mean, I, I'm just a lot more confident in who I am now ever since I've actually started coming to the school, so. Um, my advice is, as long as you know, you're following the right path 
and you're staying out of trouble and you hang around positive people, positive things, you'll be all right. Okay, hold on. And if on a day or when you see a day when it might not feel safe or for other students it might not feel safe and you can kind of understand why they might say that, what, are you, what do you think they're thinking about? So, um, for other students, um, who, who doesn't stay on the um, right path or the positive route, um, and they get into things like uh, harm done to others, um, you know, my school, Riverside, there is, like I said, there is support, and, you know, it never fails to get the kids on track and help them out when they need. And our security guards and our teachers and my principal will definitely get to them and help them out and reach out to them uh, the best way they can. Excellent. Thank you for that, Chris. <laughs> sir. I'm sorry, what's your name again? Netal. Netal. I'm sorry. Netal. Um, both both sides. Question. Mm -hmm. The question is if when you go to school in person, do you feel safe in school for the day or throughout the day? And if you go to school in person and you don't feel safe at some period during the day, why not? So first, why if you feel safe? Why not if you don't feel safe? Okay. Um, I feel safe when I come to school. Um, the security guards are very helpful and I respect what they're doing, checking people to see if they have any objects on them. Um, and, and the times I really don't feel safe is like, really when people are mostly skipping class, causing ruckus in the hallways, and basically, like not doing the things they're supposed to be doing. You come to school to learn, not to be playing around and see your friends and stuff. Did everybody hear the talk? Okay, thank you, well spoken. Young lady. So for me, I feel very safe when going to school and it's mostly because of the staff, security officers, and administrators who are working hard in our school. And every day, we begin our day by lining up where teachers would be looking at, checking at our student ID to make sure there's no trespassing going on. And security officers would be using the metal detectors and checking our belongings to make sure something that is not supposed to be in school is not in school. And there was a time this year where somebody actually trespassed in our school and I believe this school, the administrations and the school staff to, like worked it very well and handled the situation very carefully and they made sure like students were safe. And I can say from that that uh, I can definitely trust the school administrations security officers and staff, and I think they are doing a very good job of that. Thank you, that's well stated. We Thank appreciate you. that. Um, I do feel really safe in my school. Um, the security guards, they do everything that they can to ensure the safety of students at my school, and I have seen, you know, security cameras around the entire school, you know, they have everything secure and the other day there was an unidentified person in the school. They immediately went into lockdown. Nobody knew why until after the situation happened. But all I know is that you know they always they're really quick to act to act upon things. So I do feel really safe in my school. All right, thank you. <laughs> Young people if you were to have a peer group across the city where you could talk with each other from across the city, right? There's 31,000 students, so it's okay for older students to talk with the younger students. 
and there's 10,000 students in high school. So it would be great for other high school students to form a way to converse and talk about how we can improve our schools and whatever it is. So the good things that you like about your schools, let's do more of that. And here's some areas that we can help some young people who are struggling in school. Here's some conversations that we should have so we can hear from you uh, who's struggling, because you aren't struggling necessarily here. You have good heads in terms of what you need to get out of your high school. But as we have indicated, there are kids who do struggle. The data clearly show that it's not the majority of students, right? That there, of 31,000 students, it's probably 700, eight, uh, 700, 750 in the whole school system that might be struggling, especially in a difficult way right now. All of us are suffering from COVID. There's a lot of issues there. We get that. But I'm talking about some of the behavior issues and some of these things that we've been hearing for the last couple of days. So what would you say to other students? What would you, what kind of group would you form? What kind of conversations do you think we should have in order to improve, improve our uh, feeling of safety and help our young people who are struggling? What advice would you give to them? Advice that I would give to any student who's having a hard time. Um, I would say it's, really, really important to have somebody that you can trust and somebody that you can talk to. No matter if it's a school counselor, maybe even a principal. The principal at my school, you know, she talks to the students if they ever have problems. Um, you know, even other classmates, you can talk to people about things. You just have to find the right person. And I know for me, it's, I feel great when I talk things out. If I'm ever having a problem at home, or at school, I always have somebody to talk to, and it always gets a lot off my chest, and that helps me to react to certain situations in a good manner, and you know, basically react to things better than I would if I was in a bad setting or if I wasn't able to talk to anybody. I would probably act differently to certain situations and act badly. And certain things. So I would just say it's really important to have somebody that you can talk to and trust. Okay, thank you for that. Well stated. Here you go. Here you go. I would say don't keep it for the love to yourself. Like you're not alone. There are people you can reach out, ask for help, and when you're struggling, it's Sometimes it's easier and it might make you feel better to just say out loud, talk to somebody. And in my high school, administrations, teachers always say that you can come to them if you're struggling. You're not alone. So, and I'm sure this is true for like other high schools too. There are people you can talk to. You don't have to be by yourself. Like talking helps a lot. Sometimes just letting somebody know that you're kind of struggling, you need help, it will allow the other person to, to get you the help that you need. So sometimes, not sometimes, but like always speak out loud and always ask for help whenever you need it. There are people here for you. Um, my thing is, is that when you have certain emotions and you don't want to let it out, you should. It's better to help you focus and keep you on the right path. Keep keeping things to yourself is basically like it's not good for you. So my thing is, you got a whole bunch of teachers and a lot of administrators that you can talk to at school. Um, it doesn't matter who. It, well, it does matter, but. As long as you get in and out to somebody to help you with the problems that you are facing, you'll be fine. Mm. Good advice. Thank you. Yes, I agree with my peers. Communication is key. Always have somebody to talk to. Find somebody to talk to. Don't keep it all to yourself because, you know, this world about relationships and we we'll all need each other. So find somebody to talk to and from my advice for um, my peers and kids that go to school is to um, 
Always find people to talk to. It could be your friends, it could be teachers, counselors, anyone. You know, be consistent with it because you talk to them, you release all the, you know, negative or emotional distress you have, and the other can help you out and add happiness to you. Whereas you're gonna keep on working on yourself and get more advice from them, get ideas from them, get compliments from them. Something that'll make you feel better on the inside, whereas you continue to help yourself and you can also help others as well. So communication is key, never keep it inside, always let it out, you know, speak to people, find, you know, find friends, family members, anyone who you can talk to on the daily or even sometimes a week and never be shy or ashamed or embarrassed to speak to speak whatever you feel, to speak your problems. You just know that life is about relationships and there will be people there for you. Thank, Thank you, friends. All right. So colleagues, what I'm going to do now is ask the media if they have any questions of me. And if you have any questions of me that I will like perhaps to include our scholars, then we'll do it together. We'll do it together. Now certainly I have a lot of information that can be helpful to you and to the community, especially at this time. So let's get started with some of the questions. And I think that whatever I had planned to talk about will get incorporated into a good session with the media. Now not only the media, anybody from the audience who wants to speak, they will be provided this uh, microphone here. We'll put it right here. And then you can come up and address me. And we'll do it like this. Okay? And to play. not all media or all eyes, so it'll be a nice mix. So anybody who wants to come up and speak, you're welcome to do it on just about any topic. The only ground rules are that we're professional and courteous um, because students are always watching us. Okay, thank you. Media colleagues, who would like to go first? Yeah. Young lady. Um, Superintendent Couch, is there, I know that there's a database on, on the BPS website right now where it talks about suspensions and attendance records, but is there a more detailed report that parents can have access to that um, shows specific incidents? Because I was at the Board of Education meeting yesterday and several fights were addressed, other acts of violence beyond just making high. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, we have a very new and yet a very state-of-the-art uh, data dashboard that shows incidents along our um, code of conduct from level one, level two, level three, level four, and level five. Level four and level five are the high incidents of aggravated assault, Simple assault, which is a fight, aggravated is more serious, and uh, larceny, vandalism, um, arson, uh, theft, um, possession of drugs, uh, alcohol possession, threat against a teacher, threat against a student, um, physical contact with a person of authority. All of that is in our database, and we can provide a report on a daily basis for every school, not only of the, the incidents, but where they happen. So if they happen in the school or on the school grounds or outside of school, in the classroom, in the hallway, in the bathroom, near an exit, out near the buses, all of that data is there. It's very clear. It's very uh, helpful for us to drive um, strategy to try to reduce those incidents and try to provide the support we need to make sure they're safe. Now, <clears throat> that's for every school in the district, and it's since the beginning of the year. So what we're working to do is, because we have to report that to the state, we have to report these incidents to the state, and we have to report them within 24 hours. So that, that's a transparency. This is not a, what well, important some, and then others, and then this happened, and this happened. Once we find out, and as soon as it's known, it's the principal and his or her team's responsibility to put those into the system so we can make what's called a vaguer report to the state. So I think that's helpful. I think 
I've been leading and wanting to know what is going on in our schools every day on what we call a, a dashboard. So that information is here. It's actually in my bag over here. I can show you an example of what it looks like. But what we can do, we can mail you an example. We'll email you through Karan, Mr. Barnes, an example for uh, any school that you'd like to see. And I think parents should see that for their school, especially for their school. Certainly, they can look at it all around because they have siblings sometimes in different schools. But I think we're going to make that report um, uh, public. So we have a public-facing part of our dashboard, attendance, daily, um, you know, attendance and some other words. Uh, what are some other daily? Suspensions? Suspension, attendance, and some assessment data. Some assessment data. But we have a whole trance full of data, and we can put that wherever we want to put it. I look at it every day, but we can certainly work to make that more public facing. So that's a great question, and thank you for it. So short answer, yes. Do you have a, a timeline, possibly, of when that, the more detailed uh, incident report would be accessible to parents? Yeah, I just want to make sure that the process is, is clean and straight, and we're doing it just the way it's designed to do it, and that uh, we have the right, you know, we have accurate data in there. It's only as good as the input. And I think because of where we are in this, in this environment, I think it will help people feel safer if, uh, if they know the data and you'll see what that looks like for your school. Um, I think after the break sometime, I think maybe mid-March, something like that, I'd be good with that. Further? Oh, you got your hand up? Evan, tell me. So, colleagues, if you go on to our, our website, there's an orange half moon that says district data. If you push that button, our data will come up. You will see disciplinary data to the level that you can see. There's some things that everybody can't see, right? You can't tell you kids' names. You can't probably can't tell you the level of specificity that you want, but you can see as much as you could can see. Additionally, we produce a monthly report to Dr. Cass's point, there's some things that we have to go back after things, so on and so forth. So every second week, so the second week of March, you can see the final numbers for February on our website and a comprehensive report. That data is already up then? Excuse me? That data is already up then? What you're talking about, you're saying you want to put more data. The data that I'm talking about, I don't think is up. But the data for suspensions, for attendance, for um, discipline, referrals, maybe at the level of the school. Holistic, you can see holistically is front faced. And we can help you if you have a question to walk through that, we can help you with that. All right. This young lady, I believe in that. Well, I was, as far as I kept, and maybe it's changed, the, the attendance records don't cover virtual learning and who showed up to class for virtual learning or not. And I know back when the reopening plan was announced, back in what, September or August, you said that that report would be released and that you would be working on bringing back students that were chronically absent throughout the pandemic. What has been done to bring back those students that were chronically absent? Yeah, I think that's a great question. <clears throat> what I wanted to do, First of all, doesn't the date include the days that we are remote? It absolutely does. Yeah, I just want to make that clear. The data does include when we are remote. Um, but what I want, and, and we serve students on an everyday basis in about two or three categories, okay? Students who are medically fragile and the parent has signed an exempt form, they get remote instruction every day. Uh, students who are on long-term suspension uh, get the remote instruction and, and uh, receive it that way so that they're not just out on suspension. I thought that was a value add from last year having to be on COVID uh, remote for so long. Uh, at least now, when you are having to be out for disciplinary reasons, you can keep your instruction going and you know, you're learning going because we, we give you that option. Everybody has a laptop. <coughs> so. Those reasons, uh, students are on remote. I thought there was one more. Anybody want to help? What's the other? That's right. That's right. 
if, if they're, they're ill and COVID positive. They have they, they are out for quarantine purposes, they can go on and on. So what we've been doing to improve attendance, because it is variable and it's not as high as in person in the main, depending on the school. Uh, some schools low in person and low on the moat. And, and that I wanted to understand why, because I felt overall we're in person every day, we've been open all year. I thought that would be a good thing. It turned out to be much more complex than that, much more challenging than that. And so we did a survey, something similar to this, these A part, A part, B questions, but we asked, if you're coming to school every day or trying to come to school every day in person, tell us why. And if you're not coming to school every day in person, tell us why not. And that's been an interesting uh, set of data that is on, it's ongoing. We're keeping it open. But we have up to over 3,000 responses. And um, I think we have to be very thoughtful about interpreting that data. Uh, sort of number one is, is sort of COVID-related or illnesses or having to take my child to the doctor. Uh, all of those combinations, um, you only need back at the beginning of this year one good COVID quarantine and you're already at um, chronic absences and a few more and you're into severe within a short period of time. So that I had to look at a little bit, a little differently and unpack. Um, some of the issues were around transportation uh, in terms of getting uh, to school, the late pickups, uh, where we were having transportation challenges, still having some of them. Uh, but high school students have a different kind of transportation. They take you, they often take the MFTA, and so that can be crowded, uh, different routes, and then they pass by, and kids have to wait another long time before they get another bus and go. Some come all the way across town to go to Riverside, or all the way across town to go to Hutchinson. And it takes time. How much time does it take? If, who takes the transportation? How much time does it take to get to school? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Like an hour and a half. An hour and a half. Okay? How long? 45 minutes, depending on the if it's If it's clear, right? Straight yes. through. 45 minutes. So those are things that affect tardiness, certainly. And some kids, who knows, right? Could be discouraged and say, it's too late. I'm not like going to school today. I mean, we hear some of that. It's not a pattern, but it's, it's some of it. Uh, so there's, there's five top reasons. That data is, is helpful, and now we're reaching out again with this opportunity now to do a whole range of things from additional security guards, better trained security, more um, radios, high-tech radios, making sure there's personnel assigned and deployed in the school, every exit and entrance, hallways, bathrooms, um, uh, making sure that the training is up to date and, and proper for what the data say in that school, uh, reassessing, uh, you know, some of our philosophy about this. And uh, there's really a couple of students, maybe 20 in a large school, or 30, 20 to 30, much fewer in the small school, that some teachers are saying if we could provide remote learning for those students, for an extended period of time, right now, that would help calm a lot of these schools and the principals would feel like they could get back um, <coughs> the systems and procedures that would make everybody feel uh, uh, less jittery. People are shaking right now, they're jittery right now. And while I don't believe in long time separation of students, I do think that if we're spending 90% of our time on 3% of our students, those students need to find a, good, a better solution. I mean, that's just what's coming from the staff, okay? And I'm not opposed to it um, if that's what they feel they need right now. So that's a good, that's a solution coming up. So, and so there's many more, but that's, that's my answer to you. Well, I, I apologize, maybe I didn't frame the question correctly. When the reopening plan was announced, one of the big issues that was discussed was students for the period of pandemic remote learning when schools were shut down, stop showing up to virtual learning. And back then you talked about working with MVP to bring those students back that did not show up to virtual learning and you were gonna use MVP to help 
get them back to in-person learning. I did a story on that back when the reopening plan was announced. I went to do a follow-up story on that after the first, I guess, semester of school was over, and MVP told me this, the, the program was never implemented. So I'm curious how the school district brought back those students that were chronically absent during the pandemic to in-person learning. During the pandemic? When? Because we're still in it. So well, when was it? When schools were closed. Last year? When, when schools were closed, like the entire, the, when Oh, that was last closed. year. Uh, mostly, until, until February. We opened, we opened February 1 of last year. This year we've been open all year. I know. So are you talking about back, going back? Yeah, I don't I'm remember. Not. I really don't. I don't okay. remember. So I'd have to talk to my staff to understand your question a little bit better. I apologize. What I can tell you is last night the board approved MVP officially to come in to work with um, Pastor Dow's uh, organization. He has a number of organizations and they're going to work together. Hit Pastor Dow's organization is going to work on the students that are having these challenges, 30 to 40 per school, and then MVP is going to come and work with these families to try to get deeper on why aren't you coming to school, how can we help you get to school and feel safe, what do you need to feel like you, you're supported to have your child attend every day, and it's a parents helping parents initiative. So that, if it, if it paused, or if it didn't get fully implemented, it's going to resume uh, as soon as we can get them up going, with after the break of my expectations. Great question, I hope that was responsive. Yes, sir. So McKinley has been a big news story. Have you, how many policy and rule changes have resulted as a, because of that incident, and will it affect rules and policies of other schools? Excellent question. I like it. Um, I think I can answer it. So, at the level of operations is what I'm hearing most about what schools need, what principals need, teachers, and what they would like to see. Um, a little bit more security presence for at least a time. See? Three months, four months, so we feel a little differently. Um, locks, door locks, doors that don't lock. Students that can leave a door open in a jar and another can come in and it wasn't secure and nobody was there. Those kinds of things have to be absolutely buttoned down and there's a myriad of them. And that's in what we call our school safety plan. Those have to be re-examined, brought right up to best in class, <laughs> and everybody agreed upon it, and you share it in each board meeting, and not each board, but at board meetings, and to the public, we put it up on that school's website and so forth. So the safety and security plan, idiosyncratic to each school, but standardized across all schools, that has to be <coughs> done again in haste, and it has to be done again thoroughly and up to best in class standards. That was not the case. Uh, so that's what we're working on right now. And inside that are a number of requests um, that folks are asking for. And all of those that maintain a good educational environment so that students like this feel safe, we're gonna do. Some that are pushing a little bit more over into a uh, same, same kind of environment, we're not gonna quite go that far. So that's the answer, I think, on the shorthand. In terms of the policy, I think I just need a little more time to evaluate what we're doing at McKinley and then what emerges, because I'm really, really in the weeds of it now. Um, then I would then be bringing policy recommendations, <laughs> if needed, uh, to the board, and then there will be new policy. And it may well be needed. Yes. So you had mentioned that you got feedback from administration and teachers that perhaps a solution would be to remove you know, the 20 or 30 kind of problem. As long as we could do it legally, and I would right. put on, you know, my there, Have you heard anything from students, uh, feedback from them for, uh, you know, brainstorming other solutions? Yeah, that's what part of this discussion is. Certainly that's a good question for students, and if you could frame it clearly like that, let's, let's hear what they have to say. So say it again, sir. So we're talking about McKinley and the, you guys know what happened and 
uh, teachers and administration had an idea of how to maybe reduce some of the violence. Do you guys have any ideas that maybe the grown-ups haven't thought of? Um, um, I believe um, teachers need a more and more students is to be engaged in more like programs like this or clubs at school like this. They'll have their, they'll get their mind right, you know, keep them busy, keep them productive, you know, and keep them self-aware um, and know their self-worth and keep them on the right path. So programs like this one and many more will do the trick because, you know, you know, yeah, it's about people, about us. So if the students' mind ain't right, they're gonna be doing the wrong things. So we need more um, positive engagements and things where the students can get into after school, during school, to help them out. Really well stated. Did anyone else like to answer? You don't have to, but if you'd like to, answer the question. Great question. Yeah, um, I think that the teachers should, and the administrators should, like, basically, um, basically be, yeah, like, be self-aware of, like, the current situations or future situations for the schools and just any school in general. Um, it shouldn't matter what school you go to. Right. Um, this happens all over America. As you can see, Sandy Hook, a main target from that person, um, yeah, um, to help the schools, we just need to probably just get like more security, probably just to walk around the schools, just, just try to make sure everything is like 100%. And, like fix the current situation that's right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I feel like students need to feel a sense of belonging and that could be one of the reasons why there are so many volumes going around in school. Students might not feel like they belong in such a place so they try to do something to make, like to feel like they belong there. So maybe we can start like making them feel like they belong and kind of like create a bond by maybe we can do like smallest activities like do maybe during like in the morning or like during the same time we could have like uh, small activities where students will interact with each other and kind of try to create a bond and that could help like students feel a sense of belonging and maybe help decrease the violence that are going on. I think that would be a good idea. Right. Great, thank you. I, um, I agree with Anisha, honestly. I couldn't have thought about another solution. Um, students not feeling like they belong, honestly. Um, I know I feel like I belong in my high school, but I'm not sure about everybody else at my high school. I'm not, you know, I can't speak for everybody. So there's, a really good possibility that a few people at my school are feeling that way. So, or at any high school. So, more bond activities, honestly. Yeah. What's a good example of a bond activity in your experience? Well, I know. Okay, at my school, like I said before, there's a wide variety of after-school activities and things that you can also do during the day, like extracurricular um, classes and things like that. Um, I know there's a basketball team, like, you know, basketball, that's a way to bond, you know, with other students that go to your school, you know, and cheerleading and, you know, other things like that. So I think just other activities like that that students can really connect to on a deeper level would just make a big difference. Sir, you go to one of the best performing arts schools in the country. When you are preparing for a performance or a play or an individual solo or working with your classmates on something, is that 
Would you consider that a way of bonding or a form of bonding? I I definitely would. Um, I know, like, okay, if you if you were a student and you were forced, um, I know I used to go to in middle school. I used to go um, Global Customs Charter School. It's a school in Lackawanna, and they used to force me into playing violin. That's not something I would ever do, um, and it wasn't something that I enjoyed. And so I didn't feel like I really belonged at the school. I was so much more quieter. And then ever since I came to performing arts, you have such control over what classes you want to do. If they accidentally put you into a class that you never asked for, you can immediately request to go see the counselor or you know someone in that you know general area, and you know you can talk to anyone and have that change. You know you can you have control over what you want to do and what activities you want to do, and that makes a difference into, you know, when you get into that course or class or activity that you want to get into, there's people there that also share that same love and you form a bond. So that makes you feel like you're included at that school because you know there's people just like you that enjoy the same things that you do. There you go. Couldn't explain it any better. So, Kali, let me just make a summary kind of statement about these, this question that the, that the gentleman asked. Adults are making recommendations for increased safety in the main, it's a general statement, about operational issues, say, about security, uh, radios, winding, uh, buttoning down hallways and bathrooms during passing classes. A lot of operational recommendations are being made. What we're hearing from students is what the research has shown over the years. And that is, kids come to school because of great teachers, because of what's going on with their programming, as these young people said. When there's great programming at a school that can interest just about anybody, they come to school, can't wait to be in that class or do that activity. And then the third thing is, they come to school because of each other. They come to school to socialize with each other, to be with each other. And that's been true since I was in school, since you were in school. So those three things, when a school accomplishes that, plus has a tough love culture and climate in the school, you hardly have any incidents. You hardly have any incidents unless the child is really, really having a tough day and that's part of uh, what he or she is going through. But then a school like these, with these kinds of students, they will wrap around those students and like I said, as long as you have someone to talk to, those kids ultimately will be okay. But they're not okay if they stay home, if they stay isolated, if they stay remote, because that is what we're finding now after coming back to school that is, had created so many problems and too long on social media for too many young people. Too many video games that aren't healthy i not saying these young people do that, but some video games are very violent and they're very different than the Pokemon and some of these, some of these old games that they were around when I was coming around. That guy that climbed over everything, missed it, so I'm having a little mustache. It's much different today. So we're seeing kids that are having mental health issues, they're having tick issues because of what's going into their brain and the endorphins around that, way, way up here. And so if you can calm that, start to get back into some good books, start to have some really good, um, you know, after school activities and, and, and get that exercise, you see behavioral incidents go down accordingly. So we gotta get back to basics, gotta get back to basics, and that is what we're trying to do. Superintendent, I was gonna ask you a question, but something the kids said affected it. They talked about bonding. Oh, hold on, Mike. Colleague, before, oh, that's, okay, that's my mind. I'm sorry. I meant to say I was going to integrate. The, the, am I missing anybody that had a question or that wanted to come to the mic? I really apologize. Did I? Yes, you come, sir, if you want to. Yes. Let me just get that, Mike, because okay. I did promise that, and I, um, I neglected to ask. I'm sorry. We put the mic away. I'm sorry. We don't care. Oh, 
Good evening, everybody. Um, Dwayne Ferguson with the DASH program. Uh, what did I want to say, Dr. Um, Cash, that I hear security, security, security. Security is key, and I give that to you. Yeah. Well, you got to have the right security officers in the right school, for number one. Mm -hmm. For number two, you got to have uh, security officers that can be able to relate to the kids and deal with the kids and be able to listen to them because that's viable information. And viable information means that well, they know what's going on in the street, they know what's going on in school, they can take that viable information and be able to put it to the principal or the sister or the, the uh, principal of the school and let them know what's exactly going on. In my program, what I do when I have mentored my young boys, I do home visits. Because I don't want, I want to know what's going on at home, then I can come back to the school and let the principal know what's happening at home, then we can deal with whatever situation is that we're dealing with every day. And that, that calms down our situation because they know if I'm coming or they see me in school that we can talk about a lot of different things yeah, and even dealing with stuff in the community. So the most important thing, security is key, and I give you that. But the most important thing is having the right security officers having a right with security officers in the school with a relationship. You're absolutely That's right. what's important. Can we say your name again? My, my name is Dwayne Ferguson with the DASH program. Aren't we, don't we have you integrated in the No, you don't, sir. Huh? No, you don't. I thought it was Kenny Simmons and that Kenny Simmons is mad dads. I'm dads. Oh, so that's, that's a whole different program. We mad dads and dads. Look, we got to get to him, okay? okay. I appreciate you. Okay. Uh, this young lady and Mike, I'll come right back to you. Oh, okay. Mike, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm just going to ask one question, but the company of kids talked about bonding in schools and places like Hutch Tech or Performing Arts, the kind of the culture of the school gets passed down from year to year, new kids come in, other kids graduate. Has this really been sheared by COVID that the kids who were early students at Performing Arts, they, they're kind of there, but they don't know what their older some cases, maybe older brothers and sisters. And does it take time to reestablish those connections and get the kids really into the flow? It's, a, it's more of an observation, Mike, and I think I would concur. But I would say that any school at any time has got to have a leader that knows what they're doing. Because that leader, whether it's a historic school that's always had a strong culture and climate or a historic school that now is struggling, the leader is going to be the key. And so that can, that can make sure that that's a strong culture and climate in any day and age. May take just a little bit longer. May need just a little bit more support early on. But it can get to wherever Hutch Tech is, Baffa is, McKinley, and Riverside, and where McKinley needs to be. See, McKinley had a long history of being a school with a strong culture and climate. And so we can get there again. Young man, I think, knew not too long ago, just very soon ago, had a strong culture and climate that was all about Mac High Spirit. So we can get there, but it's the leader that makes the difference. And the relationships make the difference, as this young man said. And then the kids come along and they, they don't even want to hear, this is Mac, or this is the Raptors, you see. And they correct you about what their school is all about. And so that's what I want to make sure we have in every school while we're also sensitive to what's happening during this period of time right here and give everybody uh, what they need to, to, get, to get back. I have one question for you and one question for the students, if you don't mind. My sure. question for you is, we've had a lot of people in the community ask us how they can help the family of the 14-year-old victim in McKinley. I've heard about that. Thank you. We've learned that he was homeless. So many people have been reaching out to us. Has the district facilitated anything to assist him or his family? Let me just, I'm just looking because I need somebody. Yes, okay. Um, that's a great question, and I've gotten some, too. I got a... Uh, an email today from Salvation Army who said they had an apartment that they would lease and not lease, they said they'd give it to uh, this family while he was in a hospital. And they, they could live right across the street, it was right across the street from ECMC. I think that's great. And then there's been a lot of in kind and you know, computers and peripherals and uh, cell phone, because he lost his cell phone in this, in this accident. I mean, it's a tragic man. Computer, a new computer, although we'll give him that. So those are things that community organizations have uh, offered to donate. And what I wanted to do tonight is get a, is get a connect or 
that would then help if you could send that information to to a lead. And I had time to hear, but uh, can you help? Toy and I was at McKinley for the day today, and McKinley does have several fundraisers going on. You could reach the principal, Mustafa Khalil. His last name is K-A-H-L-I-L, Mustafa Khalil, the principal of McKinley, and he can help you with that because they have a number of things I just have to do. But we need a contact, so can you just make sure before we're all uh, gone that we can get a, a good connect there, okay? okay. Thank okay. you, Ebony, for that. Um, you guys have been sitting up here and an answering our questions. Thank you for doing that, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, I want to know how you're doing. I mean, it's probably been a, great a crazy week and a half since all of this happened. It's been a ripple effect throughout all of the schools in Buffalo Public Schools. How are you doing? How are your friends doing? Coping, handling, kind of moving forward, just... Overall. And let's start with this young man if we could. Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, as this weekend happened, it's been a tough week, you know, as far as everybody trying to check up on your family and basically just trying to see if they okay. Um, it is a crazy situation that did happen. Um, Will we be able to get over this? No, because we will remember this day like, like yesterday for anybody. It was a traumatic experience for families, friends, and just everybody, even the whole school district. They had a tough time handling this. And I'm glad that they all stood together with McKinley and represented our school with our colors. And So I'm grateful for that because we have a good school district to help us if one school is down, they shall all bring up that one school to be a better school. So I thank you for that question. Mm. So I do agree that it was a traumatic experience and it's something that will not be forgotten, but we can learn something out of it. So the same thing doesn't happen once more. And I would say the teachers and staff at our school are trying their best to kind of like bring out the positive vibes back and help out each other so this doesn't happen again. And including that, I would say that to prevent this from happening again, the school does like has gotten like a little bit stricter with their rules and regulation. And for a certain limit that is very reasonable, and I do agree with it. And I feel like they're like to get back to where we were before. We just need to get out the positive vibes, and instead of like um, thinking about the traumatic experience, like thinking back on the past two months, try to kind of find a solution to come forward and move on with the life. Um, when these, you know, tragic incidents happen at multiple different schools, um, it kind of reminds me that, um, you know, again, as these experiences happen, everybody, everywhere is going to be um, affected somehow, some way. And so when I see, you know, one of my friends or maybe even my family, um, when they talk about these things that happen around the city, um, it makes me just want to kind of, okay, it, it affects me too, right? And so it makes me want to help them, basically. Um, I try to get myself in a good mood because I want that to rub off on them and I just want, you know, I, I don't want the bad energy to kind of weigh everybody down, you know, because it's important to think about these things but at the same time, you don't want total sadness. You know, you want to be able to maybe find some kind of solution out of it. And so I try to stay happy and calm. And I just try to, you know, check up on people and, you know, be like, you know, how are you feeling about this? How does that you? And like, I just try to, you know, keep a smile on my face, you know, try to like rub off on them somehow, you know? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah, not gonna lie, the day the shooting at McKinley happened, um, 
at my school, like around the end of the day at three. Um, there was a fight that went down, and I was not around. I was upstairs actually with my boys, and um, I seen security running down, and uh, gave me a sense of feeling that you know security to handle it, everything will be okay. So props to security, and what I feel, what I believe is. We just need more positive interaction with each other, more positive um, engagements, more positive activities, and more more positivity around, more positive energy. That's what's really gonna bring everybody hope and the spirit to, you know, have better engagement and better relationships. Mm. <laughs> Tim Nark Newkirk. I know you agree, Pastor Newkirk, that if you come up and speak uh, and kind of piggyback off the young people and then get into what you do. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, welcome back, guys. Um, I'm Pastor Tim Newkirk, GYC Ministries, Community Action Coalition of Western New York. GYC guides young children. We represent the children in the community, in the city, in the surrounding areas. Uh, we have violence interrupters. We have credible messengers, and we're advocates for the youth and all the things that they're going through, the atrocities, we let you know that we're with you, we stand with you, and we support you in all the needs that you have and the concerns that you have. We are a voice uh, to the families, the parents, as well as the staff and uh, the board. And uh, my question is that uh, we talk about the 3%, seeing that they are the ones that we have to uh, generate our time and our energy to, but I don't know if this has been done in other cities, Buffalo is the second largest city in New York State, which means we have the largest, second largest school population in the New York region. And there's violence going on in different states and different cities. So this is not, you know, this is not new. Uh, I grew up in violence. I grew up in school, in public school. I graduated from a Buffalo public school, a vocational school, and I'm a product of what you see to change. So if it can happen for me, if I can survive a high school and get through peer pressure and gang violence and gang interruption, to become a pastor, then you could too. But the thing that I like to push is that when I was growing up in school, because Dr. Cash said back to the basics, there were staff members, there were community members, and they were also um, board members. You know, that superintendent knew us, he knew us by name, and he, uh, he gave us incentives. And it was incentives to stop the violence, stop being the troublemakers, and stop doing the things that would lead other kids to go on the wrong path. So my question is, being back to the basics of how to get these kids to interact and also deploy their own friends and stand up and have courage. What we're looking for uh, with UIC Ministry is to be uh, uh, courageous, but also to lead that to you guys to be courageous in your schools, in your community. McKinley is a, is a tremendous school. They always had good rapport when I was growing up. They had more programs growing up, so everybody wanted to go to McKinley. Mm -hmm. So to hear this, um, this tragic event that happened, it sort of just was like, Wow, I opened it because we always looked at McKinley as one of the beacon high schools in the city of Buffalo. But uh, just knowing that we can probably provide some type of initiative and incentive to the youth, for, such as yourself, for doing the outstanding an ex outstanding job and bringing that information that you're reasonable to know that you stand for righteousness and you want to go through school and you want to look back on your life and say, I was once a part of a school that had uh, some turbulence, but because of who you are, your badge, your sheriffs, your rangers, mm -hmm. to go into your school and to take the good in it and expose that and, and, and fight against the injustices that you are growing up with. Because we can't always see what you see. We don't always know what you know. You know, I had a lot of calls and a lot of kids talk to me because I coached them outside of school. And it gave me an idea of what was going on in their, in their schools and their classrooms. But to be able to work with you guys and just give you all the equipment that you need and all the instruments that you need to go into your school and to redirect some of the mindsets of the kids, recruiting, uh, bullying, you know, fear, and standing up for what's right and, you know, not looking past and walking away. You know, how can we help as parents, as teachers and community members and staff, and, and you know, you have Superintendent Cash here that's asking questions, what do you need from us along with the back to basics? And that's what we want to work with you guys so, heartily and close to and network with you guys and solve some of these problems. If you don't know how to solve them, we can try to help you as best as possible and be a vision and a voice for you guys also. So just I encourage you to keep doing good. 
because a hero is somebody that stands up against evil and stands out against all the obstacles that go on. So I applaud you for what you're doing and keep up the good work because one day you might be a Dr. Cash. And you might be a Dr. Cash. Colleagues, uh, these leaders here, uh, Tim Dunkirk, Pastor Tim Dunkirk, his colleagues, Pastor uh, James Giles, uh, Reverend Bishop Dr. Uh, Frederick Gelsey, uh, the MVP, our precious Mia, and her colleagues, they can all work together in support of you. But what I think I heard him say is join his group as a leader in the group, a ranger, a chief, a lieutenant, a colonel, a general, so that they can spread and bring more on to the fold to be the positive trajectory. I think that's what I heard you asking. That is a significant ask me, and I don't want you to lose that because now you've got a partnership with the young people at the leadership level who can then help the community leaders work with these kids that are struggling. Again, while they're not all the kids in the Buffalo public, they are, they, they, they are kids, yeah. and they need our help. And yeah. young people like this, to me, don't look like they can be helpful, don't you? Yes, we deputize you. So if you should say, look, pressure on you now, because yeah, exactly. everybody don't look, and they should. And if you're successful through the remainder of this year with the group you're working with, and I want to bring on the dad, and I want to bring on the women in this work. Yes. See? Women against violence, yes. and they have their groups, and I want us all working together, all working together. Yes. Um, let's see if that, the difference they can make, and I know it will be a great one, and then we'll carry it over through the summer, yes. so you know in idle time, and then we'll get ready and keep it going. But let's be real, colleagues, this is not an overnight in about three weeks or three months we'll be good again. This is going to take some years to get readjusted and reacclimated and, and re, um, re channel the mind. Re channel the mind. We got to get some stuff out of there and put some new vitamins and enzymes in. And I think that, that then we'll know we're back to full health on the, on the journey toward it. So thank you, sir, for what you do. And God bless. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, colleagues, and I want you to be here to hear me, especially the brothers from back in the day. One thing that's an elephant in the room, and I really didn't want to go there, but we're not passing out guns in the cafeteria. We're not handing out weapons in the hallway. We're not teaching children how to be violent. This is a community issue. Guys, I don't know if you know, remember Aaron Pryor, the boxer, okay? He was a good friend of mine. And pound for pound, that was the toughest little boxer that I ever knew. And let me tell you something. Pound for pound, Buffalo is one of the most violent cities that you can look up statistically in this country, okay? In the state, in the Northeast, and in this country. So let's not look at the schools as the epicenter of this violence. This violence starts in the community. And you've had a gun problem for a long time. You've had a violence problem for a long time. You've had a gang problem for a long time. So stop putting this on the kids. Okay? Stop putting this on the schools. This is an issue that everybody's going to have to have some accountability for. Because while that happened last week in the school, I read every night in the paper, somebody over on this street, somebody over on that street, somebody over on that community, somebody over on that street, getting shot. Almost every day. Don't get reported like this, but it's happening. So stop it with this, do you think that violence is in all the schools? No, I don't. 
what it is, it's in the community. And we got to stop it there. We got to put a spigot and twisted clothes there. And we got to all work on it there. And it won't come into the schools. Now, when it is in the schools, we'll treat it. And you've heard what some of the treatments are. Tough love, top flight security systems, more counseling, more support, supports, more mental health supports, more social emotional supports. But the schools can only do so much. Parents have an accountability. I got parents that come out of cars and jump on kids. I got parents that go into schools and punch the teacher. I got stuff happening here every day. So if all of us want to get together and solve this, then everybody has to own their accountability. And me, with my years of experience, listening to everybody, getting into the tissue of this myself now, I'm going to get a plan, plan so the schools are much safer. That's a guarantee. And then, parents, come tell me what you're willing to do. Come tell me what you're willing to do. Come tell me what you need to do. School every day, all day, get your kid there. Homework, check it. What did you do today? Know it. What are you doing after I go to sleep? Let me come back into that bed and see what you're doing. Observe it. Get off this phone. Get off of this. Read a book, pick it up. Firm handshake, look me in the eye. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Boom. No smart mouth. No back talk. This is what we're going to do together. And then this community will start to have a different flavor, a different culture to it, and a different statistic to it. But the crime statistics can't be put on the backs of 13, 14 year olds. The adults in this community, they lead the way. And these kind of people, these young people, these gentlemen, I want to lead the way, help us lead the way. And I want these children, these young people, to lead the way. Now we got a different narrative, we got a different story, and you got the narrative that can actually work, it can actually put a stop to this long standing violence. And you can lead the whole nation in how you did it, how you turned it around, and be a proof point for what is going on in this nation right now. It is going on all across the community. But I don't want us to linger in there. I don't want us to marinate in the violence. I want us to turn around and show how we did it. So, few more questions. And then we're going to close. Who would like to go next? Because I think you are going to okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you have a question? Come on up. And while she's coming up, you can ask. I just want to ask the students. I mean, you guys are obviously, just from listening, you can tell, you're good students. But two said they feel safe in school, and two said they sometimes don't feel safe in school. How do you think that affects your ability to be a good student and to move forward and be successful today, someday? <coughs> Did you hear the question? Because I didn't hear. Did you hear the question? Say it again. Oh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was. You guys are obviously good students. Yeah, you can take that down. So you guys are obviously good students. I have no problem projecting, so it's just cover your ears. <laughs> you guys are obviously good students, and two of you say you feel safe in school. Two of you said sometimes you don't, and that comes from classes getting interrupted by the handful of students that are troublemakers. But you guys are good students, so how do you think that affects your ability to pay attention in school and eventually move on to success? Um, I would say it definitely could affect our ability, but what I would do is stay in my lane and control what I can control, and that is mostly like myself and my actions. So if we have people over there, doing what's not right, I can't control that. I'll just do what's right myself and control what I can control. 
and continue doing good for me and others. I don't think we need to go around because, and that's just, I do want to hear from this young man, but I want to, want to keep moving with the questions and begin to wrap up. Go ahead. Okay. Um, what I would say is that um, my thing is if you see that negative stuff happening, basically people like doing cars and ruckus and stuff, I think you should just try to block out the negativity and push, push forward into what you need to do to help yourself get success. And maybe if you got the time to help these people out, get from the negative into the positive, basically to uplift and help these people out in a situation. Maybe something going on at home and then they act out at school. You should try helping them get an administrator to talk to them and basically fix their problems. I think that's well uh, any, any further questions, colleagues, because we're getting ready to close. This young lady, you have the final question or comment. Good evening. Um, I have a student, uh, a child at McKinley High School, mm. who's been very affected by um, the behaviors and things that have been going on um, inside and outside the school. My question is, Superintendent Cash, how are we going to keep our children safe in school? How are we going to fix what's broken? Um, and I know we can't control everything that's going on outside of the homes and things like that, but I think that schools should be someplace that they should be safe. You can just speak to that place. Thank you. Is that Mustafa? Yeah. yeah. So, Mustafa, come down, please. <clears throat> Because ultimately, this is going to be your responsibility and your leadership that makes a difference. So one of the things, young lady, that we've done is install what we think will be a great principle that matches the need for the time. Matches the need for the time. Come on up. Stop. Come on up. And this, this young man, um, I have chosen and to put over at McKinley High School. He has risen to the challenge by saying, I accept. Not only do I accept, I look forward to it. He has been speaking with parents over these last week, speaking with teachers, with students, all of the McKinley family. His narrative has been strong. It's resonated with me that he can do the job. And meanwhile, we have a organic plan, a growing plan that will talk about all of the things that need to be reset over at McKinley. From not only it's not how many security guards you have, it's how many great security guards you have who develop the relationships with people, who know what their assignments are, who are trained in the young people of today. We've got to get better communication going from security to administration to downtown to back again, all the way up through our protocols and our chain of command. We've got a lot of operational things to fix, from windows to doorways and door locks and make sure that the hallways and the bathrooms and everything are tough love, firm, but relationship-based, relationship-based. The mayor, in his grace, and has been great through all of this uh, with us and with McKinley High School, is going to assign two SROs to the school coming back off the break, the parents and teachers and staff said we need a little more time, we want to come back after the break, not before the break. Although the students have been in after school activities all through this week. <laughs> Those SRO presidents who he selected purposely for their relationship with, with young people, I think will be helpful. Uh, and then just a whole host of instructional, emotional, social emotional supports, more behavior specialists, a couple of more social, social workers and people who are trained in trauma uh, will be supporting schools. Central office has uh, been around the clock support for uh, the past week, over there, weekend, late at night, helping this young man reestablish that culture. So 
That's how we want to make children and everybody feel safe, parents, everybody. And there's a lot in that detail that I'm working to refine right now. And as soon as that we find that, I'm going to give it out to everyone so they can see, uh, the public can see what we're doing in McKinley. And what my goal is, is what we're doing with McKinley, because it takes a minute to build these plans out. You can't build them in one day. Is, and with the help of these gentlemen that we've been talking about, it'll be a model for all the other schools. And the other schools can then look at it like a menu. Okay, my school is different, but I like what this and this and this, and I could use that here. Let me choose these strategies for my school. And another school choose their strategies and so forth. And so yes, I'm going to be looking at this district-wide and providing this opportunity for all of our schools to improve the safety and security of their schools. Remember, physical safety is just one type of safety. There's psychological safety, there's emotional safety, and there's spiritual safety, which I would like to see more of in our schools. And <clears throat> whatever that you practice, not saying any one thing, is grounded in your spiritual foundation. And so we're going to do it and use this as an opportunity. If she said it best, and he said it best, and he said it best, and he said it best, take the opportunity that's here. Take the opportunity that's here to improve and get better than ever before. And that's what we're going to do. Khalil, if you could come up and say a few words, I'm going to give you the last words. Mustafa Khalil, new principal of Kennedy High School. Good evening, and thanks for coming. Uh, I guess I've been kind of made somewhat famous. Uh, I'm all over the place. Not used to it, um, but I, I have to say uh, thank you to Dr. Cash, the board, uh, for putting me in this position, for, for believing in me. Uh, what happened last Wednesday was a real tragedy. Um, I've said this story, you've heard, um, maybe you've heard it, but it was my son's birthday, I wasn't supposed to start until Monday. And when I heard about that tragedy, uh, I couldn't leave the Mac family, right? Uh, I told my wife, I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I got Miss Satan's birthday, my son, uh, and I, I gotta go there. And I didn't know what I can do for them, but I just knew that, that emotional support, me being out there for them, and reaching out to them on Facebook, like, hey, kiddos, check in with me, you know, gave them some sort of normalcy, some sort of peace of mind. The staff, I'm sorry, I should have started off with this. The staff and the kiddos that were in that, in, in that tragedy were heroes that night. Um, we said, I said yesterday that saying not all heroes wear capes, they were the true heroes that night. Um, I couldn't have been more proud to be, uh, to be the leader of uh, McKinley High School. The kid, what happened, I remember teachers and students like, well, what are we going to do? And I'm like, listen, we're going to get through it, right? The big thing right now is I, I didn't care about instruction the few days after, after uh, the, the events, right? I just, Get on, talk with your teachers, make the connections, just check in with them. And that was our biggest thing. And the, the love and support I've gotten from the Mac family through the Facebook page has been unbelievable. And I know Mac High is going, is going places. It's known as the best kept secret in Buffalo. And I'm just going to end with this. City Honors and Hutch Tech, we coming for you. We ain't going to be the best kept secret. We are going to be the best in the land. So the best in this country, the best in, best in the city. So we coming for you. Thank you, guys. All right, colleagues, good evening. Have a great evening. Stay safe. We appreciate you. And anytime you need to have a question, reach out to Mr. Barnes. So Ron Barnes, my new special assistant to the superintendent for community relations, doing great, and he's a buffalo, he's a buffalo man, Karan Barnes. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, students, you were terrific. Just awesome.